Amen. How many believe the king is still alive? Woohoo! You may be seated. All right. The Torah portion today is what? Bashalak. Now, I don't know if you know this, but sometimes Israel sends uh, messengers or ambassadors uh, from Israel over to the United States, and they are called a shaliach. Shalak, shaliach. And guess what English word shaliach is translated as? Apostle. So the 12 apostles were the 12 shaliachs or the 12 sent ones. And so here we see uh, Beshalach, it talks about when Pharaoh is sending all the Jews and Israelis out of Egypt. Now this weekend is a very special weekend. It is called Shabbat Shira. Now, do you know what Shabbat Shira means? It is the song at the sea. And so it's Shirat Hayam, Yam is sea. And so here, this is when the very day, the Torah portion is about when they crossed the Red Sea, the waters parted. So that's what this weekend here is all about. Now look at Exodus 13, 17 through 19. And it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go. Who did he let go? The people. That God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. That's the Gaza Strip. If you see, if you can imagine Israel and Egypt where Hamas is, you know, that's the Gaza Strip area. That's real close to Egypt, but he didn't lead them that way. It says, God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war. Who might repent? The people. And they returned to Egypt, but God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. Do you know what that word harnessed means in Hebrew? It means they had military gear on ready for war. So now wait a minute. If the children of Israel went up harnessed ready for war out of the land of Egypt, who are the people that God was afraid of might return to Egypt? The Egyptians and the mixed multitude. There were a bunch of Egyptians and a mixed multitude. They are the people that God was concerned about would return back. They didn't have as much invested in it as the Jews did for 210 years being slaves. Many of the people weren't slaves, but they saw what happened and they said, well, we're gonna go with their God. So when it talks about the people here, it's referring to the mixed multitude, not necessarily the children of Israel because they went out militarily ready. And so then it says, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, remember? It says, for Joseph had straightly sworn the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you and you're to carry up my bones out of here. And so uh, what do we see now in Leviticus 23, verse six and seven? This is very important. And on the what day of the same month? 15th day of the same month, what day is before Nisan 15? Nisan 14. And Nisan 14 is Passover, right? Yeah. Passover's on Nisan 14. And then it says the next day, the 15th day of this same month, begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Seven days you're to eat unleavened bread. Now look at this. It says the first day you're to have a holy convocation and do no work, but you're to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. And then it says, and the seventh day is also a holy convocation and you'll do no work. So if you look at this calendar that I put up, of course, all the Saturdays are Shabbats, but if you'll notice the 15th of 
Nisan, you'll notice uh, the fifth is the 14th of Nisan, which is Passover. And then that evening of the 14th begins the 15th. And it says the first day is a Sabbath and the seventh day is a Sabbath. So here we can see you can have four Sabbaths within two weeks. Does everyone follow me? The first day is a Sabbath, regardless of what day of the week it falls on. And the seventh day is a Sabbath, regardless of what day it falls on, okay? The first day of unleavened bread and the seventh day of unleavened bread are Sabbaths. And on the Sabbath, you're not supposed to do what? Work, that's what it says. Okay, so put that in the back of your mind. We're gonna come back to that in a little bit. Also, what do we know? The 15th, because it is based on the lunar calendar, is a full moon. So the first day of unleavened bread, which is the 15th, is also the full moon. And so we find that God promised Abraham that his children would leave Egypt with a great treasure. What great treasure was God talking about? In Genesis 15, 14, it says, I will be the judge of that nation whose servants they are, and they will come out from among them with what? Okay. Now, if you remember, all the Egyptians gave them all kinds of things before they left. Look at this. The great treasure was not just the gold and the silver vessels that the Jews took with them out of Egypt. The great treasure was also the remnant of the nations, the mixed multitude. There was great wealth referring to the nations. They were the mixed multitude. And when the verse says that the Israelites emptied out Egypt, that's Exodus 12, 37. It says they emptied out Egypt. Well, we know there were still people there. What were they referring to? It doesn't just refer to the gold and silver. The Israelites emptied out of Egypt every person who had any redeeming spiritual value. Isn't that amazing when you think about that? Egypt was left both physically and spiritually empty as well as morally bankrupt. And I can't help but thinking of what's happening in Europe right now. I mean, look what happened in Spain. They kicked all the Jews out and they were no longer the great nation. England, same thing. They were a great nation. They kicked all the Jews out and they fell apart. Exodus 14, 2. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel that they turn back and then encamp before Piha he wrote. It's right between Migdol and the sea before Baal Zavon. Now, Zavon basically means hidden. If you remember, Safun at the Passover Seder, you hide the third, the broken matzah, you hide that underneath. That's Zavon. Uh, and it basically means uh, to be hidden. So it's the bale that's hidden. Over against it, it says, that's where you're to camp by the sea. And Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, aha, they're tangled in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. And so what do we find in chapter 14 of verse 11 and 13? Now, here comes Pharaoh with all of his chariots and horses and they're coming at him and they turn and all they see is this ocean <laughs> that is sitting there. And then what are they supposed to do? And so we find that they said to Moses, is it because there's no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away just to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't this what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we can serve the Egyptians. You know, I find that so true. So often some people, they become slaves and then uh, I think it's the Stockholm syndrome. Something like that is what it's called where they end up identifying with their captors. They end up identifying with them and they, it's, it's like I'd rather be with the devil I know than the one I don't know. I mean, that's just kind of like where they're at here. And they say, um, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the wilderness. And so Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. I think it's fascinating how soon the Israelites forgot their firstborns were all slaughtered. 
you know, and they were thrown into the sea. They were ready to go back just for the leeks and onions. But what happens? In verse 15 through 17, you know, Moses is crying out to God, do something. And God says to Moses, you do something. <laughs> go forward. It says, the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Speak to the children of Israel that they do what? And they look at this ocean and they go forward. I mean, oftentimes what this tells me is praying is great, but action is greater. I mean, you've got to pray, but then do something. That's what's so important. Don't ask God to do everything. Before he splits the sea, what happens? According to uh, Jewish, ancient Jewish literature, here, Moses is, you know, stretch out his hand toward the sea and all the Jews are waiting for something. One person just ran and jumped into the water. And it wasn't until that one person jumped in the water that the sea finally split. Does anyone know the name of the person who jumped in? Nakshon. Nakshon was the prince of the tribe of Judah, which is why Judah got to go first on all their journeys through the wilderness. Because Nakshon jumped in and the minute he jumped in, the water splits. But listen to this. God says to Moses, but lift you up your rod and stretch out your hand. So Moses had to do something. He had to stretch out his hand over the sea, divide it, and then the children of Israel will go on dry ground. Now that's what's amazing to me. I mean, no one can explain dry ground. That's all that murky, muddy stuff when the water divided, but no, they can... The Egyptians can drive chariots on this hard ground through the middle of the sea. But then he says, I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians. So God is going to harden their hearts, not just Pharaoh. He's going to harden all the Egyptians that are in his army. He's going to harden their hearts so they're all going to pursue him. And it says, and they're going to go in after them, and I will get myself honor over Pharaoh and over all of his armies, even his chariots and over his horsemen. So here, the whole key about the Egyptians and Pharaoh is they have a hard heart. And then we see God tells Moses, stretch out your hand, and the ground becomes dry. In Exodus 14, is he, stretch out your hand. That's what he says several times. Let's look at this. Exodus 14, 19, 22, the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, yet it gave light by night. And the one didn't come near the other all night. And then what did Moses do? He stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all night and he made the sea dry land and the waters were divided and the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Now, uh, one thing I want to mention most of us, when we see the story of the Red Sea, we see like a uh, hundred yards or a quarter mile of dry ground. When you do the math, it had to be almost 20 miles wide. You have 3 million Jews that all have to get across, you know, at night. It was about 20 miles wide to get all of them through in one night. Now, what did, look at Exodus 14, 26 through 29. Again, the Lord said to Moses to do what? Stretch out your hand, right? Over the sea and the waters may come again on the Egyptians and on their chariots and on their horsemen. And so what did Moses do? He stretched forth his hand over the sea. The sea returned to a strength when the morning appeared. The Egyptians fled against it and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the middle of the sea. The waters returned, covered the chariots, the horsemen, the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. And there remained not so much as one. 
But the children of Israel walked on dry ground in the middle of the sea and the waters were walled them on the right hand and on their left. That same sea that brought judgment on the Egyptians brought life to the Israelis. So it's always perspective. When you see something that happened, it's all, just like the judgment seat of Christ. Is it good or bad? Depends on which side you're on. So the same God that brought judgment also brought life. As Egyptians had a disregard for human life by throwing them into the sea, now the hard-hearted Egyptians were also destroyed in the sea. Now, this is a cool, this is on, in every Torah scroll. Again, they could have done this in English. I don't know why they didn't. But in every Torah scroll, you can see they write that section and it looks like a wall of water on each side and there are the uh, Israelis running through the sea. Uh, I always thought that was really cool, but every Torah scroll from the beginning has been written. Uh, you can see that when you go to El Shaddai at our offices, we have a Torah scroll open and you can actually see that that's how every Torah scroll is written and it looks just like that. I always thought that was really cool. Okay, <clears throat> and so in Exodus 14, 30 through 31, it says, thus, said, thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord, believed the Lord, and his servant Moses. Okay. Now, let's see. So here we go. If you remember... God struck them down and it was at midnight, all right? That's when it was, it was at midnight. And one of the things I wanna point out, and I just put these days in there, let's say Nisan 14 was a Wednesday, that's Passover, okay? And then Nisan 15, Nisan 16, Nisan 17. Let me just look at something real quick. All right, so what do we see here? The 14th Passover is not a Sabbath, but as we talked about, Nisan 15 is a high Sabbath. It's the first day of unleavened bread, even though it could be Thursday night going into Friday. Okay, so if you remember, they put the blood on the doorpost on the Nisan 14 and then after sunset, Passover, the unleavened bread began. At midnight, everybody dies and Pharaoh sends all the Jews out. And so their picture is all of Israel on Nisan 15, the first day of unleavened bread, loaded with burdens, with all the great wealth, and they're leaving on Nisan 15. Does everyone see that? Okay, the next night, uh, would begin the Sabbath. Now, uh, because it goes from Friday through Saturday. Well, Saturday's the normal Sabbath. And then Sunday, Saturday night to Sunday, is not a Sabbath. And then when you go through to the next week, the last day of unleavened bread would be a Sabbath. So what do we uh, find here? They, they were, you know, leaving because they didn't cross the Red Sea until the last day of unleavened bread. And so they're, here they are, they're running toward the Red Sea. And then what happens? They end up getting caught between the sea and the Egyptians. So here is the week of unleavened bread. Passover on the 14th, they're putting the blood on the doorposts, okay? And then at midnight, all the firstborn die. So on the first day of unleavened bread, what do they do? They're packing up and they're leaving. And it's not until the last day of unleavened bread that they open up the Red Sea and they all run across the Red Sea with all their burdens. So it takes a week from the first day of unleavened bread when they're running from Pharaoh, he let them go, to the last day of unleavened bread, that's when they cross the Red Sea. Okay, is everyone following me? Okay, so let's look at it this way for a second. What we find in uh, Deuteronomy, if you looked at Deuteronomy 1.3 on your notes, it says, it came to pass in the 40th year, 
in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, okay, so I have, uh, it says that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all the Lord had given him in the commandment unto them. What month is the 11th month of the biblical calendar? Shabbat, what we're in right now. Last Monday was the first of Shabbat. Last Monday was the very day Moses began speaking uh, the book of Deuteronomy. The entire book of Deuteronomy happens in one month, basically. The whole book takes place in one month. Here, Moses' final speech in Deuteronomy begins on Shabbat 1. We just read that. The first day of the 11th month, that is Shabbat 1. Okay? So Monday, January 23rd, was the first of Shabbat. We're now in that month. Well, guess what? This coming Monday, as I told you, February 6th is the 15th of Shabbat, or it's also called Tu B'Shavat. Does anyone know what the Tu means? I will tell you. You will always know. There is two. It's the Tet, okay, and the Vav. Do you remember the numerical value of the Tet? Nine. And what's the numerical value of a Vav? Six. So it's called the 15th of Shabbat. Two is numbers here. It's not word. So two by Shabbat means the sixth and the ninth added together, the 15th of Shabbat. And then Wednesday, February 15th is the 24th of Shabbat. Can you believe it? February 15th of our calendar is the 24th day of Shabbat. Why is that significant? Does anyone remember? Well, look at Zechariah chapter one, verse seven. On the 24th day of the 11th month, the month of what? Shabbat. In verse eight, this is the night that Zechariah sees the vision of the four horses of the apocalypse. Now, one thing that I've always thought interesting and that I firmly believe, pretty much, I believe that the visions occur on the day that they will happen. And so on the 24th of Shabbat is when he sees the four horses of the apocalypse. I believe some year it will be on the 24th of Shabbat that the first horse may start riding. Just a thought. Now, Moses dies on the seventh day of Adar. How do we know Moses dies? Well, let's look. I'm going to prove this to you. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 2, Moses was how old when he died? He was 120. His eye wasn't dim. His natural force uh, wasn't abated. The children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for how many days? 30 days. Okay, well, if you go from Shavat 1 to Adar 7, when he dies, then it says there are 30 days of mourning, right? Okay, so Shavat 1 to Adar 7, then there's Adar 7 to Nisan 7. Okay, that's the 30 days of mourning. Adar 7, he dies. You go 30 days, that takes you to Nisan 7. Does everyone understand that? Seventh of Shabbat. Okay, now watch this. Nisan 7 is what I just said. This is when they're crossing the Jordan in three more days. So on Nisan 7, God tells Israel, okay, the time of mourning is over. Watch this. It says in Joshua 1, verse 1 and 2, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, hey, Moses' minister is who Joshua, the son of Nun was. And he said, look, Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. The time of mourning is over. Let's do something. And so look at what the scripture says here. Uh, it says, therefore, arise and go over the Jordan you and all the people to the land which I give them, even to the children of Israel. Okay, so we, we see, look at the next verse, 10 and 11. 
Then Joshua gave their orders to those who were in authority over the people saying, go through the tents and give orders to the people saying, get ready a store of food for in three days, you are to go over this river Jordan and take for your heritage, the land which the Lord your God is giving you. Okay, well, guess what? That takes us to the 10th of Nisan when they finally cross with the Ark of the Covenant. Seven plus three is 10. So Adar seven, Moses dies. 30 days later is Nisan seven. Then he says, get ready and get your food prepared because in three days on Nisan 10, we're gonna cross over into the Jordan. So look at this now. In Joshua 4, 18 and 19, it came to pass when the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord were come up to out of the midst of the Jordan and the soles of the priest's feet were lifted up onto the dry land that the waters of Jordan then returned to their place and flowed over all its banks as they did before. And the people came up out of the Jordan on what day? The 10th day of the first month. Okay, so we know Nisan 7 is the, ends the or Adar 7. Okay, Moses dies. They have 30 days of mourning, which takes you to Nisan 7. Then there's three days of packing and they cross on Nisan 10. But what happened during those three days? That's when all of the males were circumcised that weren't circumcised. That happens. Uh, look at uh, Joshua 2, 1 and 2 also. It says, then Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men from Shittim secretly with the purpose of searching out the land of Jericho. Do you remember Rahab the harlot and the, these two spies go in? This time, Joshua didn't send 12 spies. He only sent two and nobody knew he sent them. They were sent secretly and they're the ones who run into Rahab. Look at Joshua 2, 21 and 22. And she said, let it be as you say. And she sent them away and they went and she put the bright red cord in the window and they went into the hill country and they were there how many days? Ha, ah, so the three days everyone on this side are being circumcised is the same three days the two spies are spying out Jericho. It's the same time frame. And then... Uh, till the men who had gone after them had, uh, them had come back now and those who went after them were searching for them everywhere without coming across them. Now look at Joshua 2, 23. Then those two men who were gone for three days, they came down from the hill country, went over and came back to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they gave him a complete account of everything that had taken place. So this happens the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th. These are the three days. Now look at Joshua 5, 5. It says, all the people who had came out had undergone circumcision, but all the people whose birth, and let me rephrase this, all the people who came out of Egypt had undergone circumcision because they were circumcised before the Passover on Nisan 14 when they put the blood on the doorpost, they had already undergone it. But it says, everyone who was born in the wilderness weren't circumcised. So all of a sudden, you've got all of Israel and the mixed multitude are circumcised coming into the wilderness, but they never circumcised any of the kids for 40 years. So now Joshua says, okay, guys, you all got to be circumcised before we can go into the promised land. So here's the question. Did they keep Passover in the wilderness for those 40 years? Well, the answer is, Everyone who came out of the initial Egypt, they did keep the Passover, but none of the kids could. So for 40 years, none of the kids that were circumcised, that weren't circumcised, couldn't keep the Passover because you had to be circumcised to keep the Passover. So you have two completely generations. The older generations were all circumcised and that next generation for 40 years, they never could keep the Passover with their parents. So this now in the promised land becomes their very first Passover. It's just like Adam when they left Egypt, it's now their very first Passover, which I thought was kind of interesting. Okay, Exodus 12, 34. Again, let's go back and look. It says, the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. So you can imagine on the 15th of Nisan, everyone has everything bound up on their shoulders for almost a whole week until they cross the Red Sea. Now, let me bring this out because I'm running out of time. The first day 
of unleavened bread is what? It's a Shabbat. And they're carrying loads on Shabbat. And the seventh day is a Shabbat. And guess what? They're carrying their burdens on a Shabbat. Wow. And we know that Pharaoh, his heart was hardened. And we know Moses, God said, stretch out your hand, right? Okay, so what happens? We're going to go for a minute real quickly to the New Testament. In Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, it says how Yeshua entered again into a synagogue, and there was a man there. So let's bring up the man. And his hand was all withered. And while the scribes and Pharisees were watching him, they wanted to see if Yeshua would heal him on a Sabbath day that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, stand up. And then he says to the scribes and Pharisees, is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved because of the hardness of their heart, he said to the man, what? Stretch out your hand. And what happens? He stretched it out and his hand was restored and healthy. And the Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. What is happening? This whole New Testament story, if you don't understand the Tanakh, you sh the reason why they wanted to kill him, don't you think it's a little over the top to want to kill somebody for healing somebody? The reason why they wanted to kill him is because Yeshua is taking the role of God saying to the man with the withered hand, stretch out your hand. And the man with the withered hand who stretches out your, his hand is taking on the role of Moses. And the scribes and the Pharisees are the hard-hearted Egyptians who didn't want this miracle to take place. So the whole reason they're upset and wanted to kill him because they saw that Yeshua was playing the role of God the man with the withered hand. And what happened, if you remember, they worked on the Sabbath. They were uh, for their deliverance at Passover. On the first day of unleavened bread is the Sabbath, they're carrying their burdens. On the last day, they're carrying their burdens through the Red Sea. And so God says, you're bringing up Moses. You want to judge me out of the law? Moses even allowed them to carry burdens on the Sabbath. Isn't that amazing? So with that said, let's stand. And let's pray. We'll take a break and then we'll come back and we'll have some worship. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for all those who are listening locally throughout the United States, throughout the world. Father, we want to make that New Testament come alive. And it's only as we connect it back uh, to the scriptures that we see just how alive the Bible really can be, but we've got to make the connection. And today, Lord, we want to connect with you. And I just pray right now, Lord, you would give us all eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to understand what you're trying to tell us. Father, that we too might arise from our slumber and be awake to you and to the things that are happening right now before us. We don't want to be asleep. We want to go with our eyes wide open. And Father, we just thank you for all of those who tithe or send offerings because we want the light of your Torah to make a huge impact in this world. We want to honor you. We want to glorify you. We want to bring honor back to the Torah. We want to magnify it. And I thank you for all who help in Yeshua's name. Amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord, our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord, our God. Take a break. Okay, now here comes the big question quiz time. How long did the plagues last from the first plague turning the Nile into blood to the last plague when the death of the firstborn happened? Did it take two years, one year, two months? How long? Anybody have a wild guess? Two years? One month? You're the winner! 
yeah, all the plagues took place within five weeks. And I'm going to prove that to you now through the math. All right, so here we go. Let's bring up the first one. Now, the time frame for the 10 plagues. The Bible says that Moses was 80 years old when he appeared before Pharaoh, right? And how old was he when he died? And what's 120 minus 80? 40 years, and that's how long it lasted. So if you start from his 80th birthday and you go to when he dies at 120, that is 40 years. Now, I just showed you how he was born on the seventh day of the month of Adar. He also died on the seventh day of the month of Adar. That's what I showed you is how he died on the seventh of Adar. He was born on the same day that he died. And so you see under the Wednesday there, Adar 7, and I have the Bible verse there. That's when Moses was born, when he turned 40 and struck the Egyptian, when he turned 80 and appeared before Pharaoh, and when he turned 120 when he died. Okay? He was born on Adar 7, died on Adar 7, and that is Exodus 7, 7. And on Adar 8, it was the next day that he appears before Pharaoh and turns the water to blood. That's Exodus 7, 15. And it says it was blood for seven days. Well, then you go to Exodus 7, 25, you find that it was seven days. And then you go to Exodus 8, 2, it says the next day comes the frogs. And then the next day they were all laying there dead. And that's Exodus 8, 2 and through 8, 14. And then Exodus 8, 16, it says, then came the lice. And that lasted for a couple of days. Uh, Exodus 8.20 is the flies. Exodus 8.31, the flies die. Uh, then you have Exodus 9, 3 through 5. You know, it was kind of a break uh, for one day. And then the next day is all the cattle die. And then you have the boils. And then you have the plague of hail with fire. And, uh, you know, then come the locusts. And then the three days of darkness. Now, all of us know Nisan 14 at Passover is when they put the blood on the doorpost, right? Nisan 15 is when they left. Well, it is five weeks from Adar 7 to Nisan 14. So, if we know the Bible says he was 80 years old when he appeared before Pharaoh. If the plagues lasted over a year or two years or whatever... Well, first off, they couldn't have, if they were going to leave on Nisan 14, it had to, the plagues had to end on Nisan 14, either this particular year, or let's say it was the next year that it happened. If it was the next year that it happened, Moses would have been 81 and he would have died at 121. So the fact that he was 80 when he appeared and five weeks later is Nisan 14, then it couldn't have lasted any shorter or longer. If it was short, if, if it began earlier, then he would have been 79. He wouldn't have been 80. You follow me? So we know the plagues from the Bible and the math literally lasted five weeks. From Adar 7 to 14 is 1 to 21 to 28 to 6 to 13. So that's how long the plagues lasted in the Bible. And you can just look at that uh, from the math. Okay, now, in our Torah portion, uh, as you know, we have the epic crossing of the Red Sea, and we have Moses and Miriam's song at the sea, which is why, you know, this is Shabbat Shira. And also in this Torah portion, we have the manna falling from heaven, and then it ends with the dramatic story of Amalek attacking Israel. So we're going to look at a few more verses, and then we're going to jump into the letter Koth. Exodus 16, 2 and 3. I mean, they, they just got done crossing the Red Sea and seeing all these miracles. And it says, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured. They murmured against Moses and Aaron 
in the wilderness. Oh, now, if you look up at the calendar here, let me just see. Oh, I, I'm giving the verses. Okay, so here we go. Let's go back. And it's, look at what they said. The children of Israel said to them, would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord. And God says, I can arrange that. In the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, when we ate bread, you brought us into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger. You know, the sad thing about this, it, it's like saying God only saved us so he could kill us. I mean, a horrible attitude after he did all these miracles for him. And then he says, in Exodus 16, 4, the Lord isn't real happy, but he's kind. The Lord says to Moses, behold, I'm going to rain bread from heaven and the people will go out and gather how much? A day's portion that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. Why only a day's portion? Remember the Our Father, give us this day our... I mean, if God gave us our full inheritance ahead of time, let's say he gave us 40 years worth of manna, we take off and never meet with him again. But the fact that he gives it to us every day means he's gonna come back to get another day's portion. There's a, a story where a father had two sons and one son was pretty rebellious uh, and he gave him his inheritance and that son just took off. And then the older son said, well, how come you're not gonna give me mine? And he says, well, because I love you. I want to be with you every day. You know, and it's uh, sometimes giving someone everything they want and they have no need to come back and build a relationship. We find sometimes that is not good. Um, that's, uh, I have here when we focus, and this is also important from another standpoint, but when we focus on hoarding wealth, it can turn into something spiritually ugly. Just as the manna turned rancid, if you hoarded it, sometimes hoarding wealth will also sicken your soul. When we cling to material things, we no longer need to rely on God because we can rely on ourselves. That's why Yeshua said it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. I mean, typically what happens if someone waits to distribute their wealth till after they die, guess what? Everybody fights over it. It's a big disaster. I would personally would rather give it away while I'm alive so I can see the joy of the people receiving it and not have those problems. Okay, let's look at Exodus 16, 25 through 29. Same thing. It says, Moses said, eat today for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. And then he says, today you're not gonna find the manna in the field. Okay, so that's why six days you're gathered, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath and in it there will be none. And then it says it happened on the seventh day that some of the people went out to gather and they didn't find any. And then the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Behold, because the Lord has given you the Sabbath, therefore he gives you on the sixth day the bread for two days. Everyone stay in their place. Let no one go out of his place on that seventh day. It is kind of like the Shemitah year. Here, God said, I will give you in the Shemitah year three years worth of food. They said, great. And then on the Sabbath, they kept working anyway. I mean, it doesn't take any faith to rest on the Sabbath when you've harvested three years of goods. But the problem is they don't want the relationship with God. They want to just keep getting the wealth. I think it's interesting in this story that even though the manna fell every day of the week except Shabbat, there still were a group of people who went out to gather manna on the Shabbat. As seen in this verse, it says, it was on the seventh day that some of the nation went out to gather and they did not find, right? Now I want to expound on the word find. In general, people use the word to find when it refers to something they lost but they hadn't lost the manna. It never was there. In this case, they did not lose the manna. The manna didn't come down on Shabbat. So why does the Torah use the word they did not find it? There's a story in the Midrash tells us about two men. 
Remember Dathan and Abiram? Remember them? They had hoped that the people of Israel would not believe Moses when he told them that the manna would not come down on Shabbat. They wanted to undermine their leader, Moses. So they went out very early on Shabbat morning and they scattered manna on the ground. And then they called the children of Israel and said to them, come and see there is manna on Shabbat. Moses is lying. But in the meantime, before they could come, birds came and ate the manna. So when the people of Israel went out to see, they didn't find the manna that Dathan and Abiram had scattered. That's what the find is referring to. That is why the Torah uses the words and they did not find because it's referring to the manna that Dathan and Abiram scattered previously. Now let's go to Exodus 17, one through three. How many of you know water is important? How long can you go without water? Okay, and if there was water and you had like 3 million people, how are you going to ration it? You need a lot of water. And if you got 3 million people and there's no water, who's going to be the first one to the uh, water supply when you do find it? So this is a big concern for everybody. And it says here in Exodus 17, there was no water for the people to drink which is why the people chided with Moses and they said to Moses, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said, well, why are you mad with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted for water. And then here we go again, the people murmured against Moses. And they said, why is this? You brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst. Well, it's interesting. The Hebrew word here is loon. And what it means, it means to chide with Moses like all night long. Here Moses is in his tent and he's sleeping. And all night long while he's trying to sleep for like eight hours, people are going, Moses, give us water. Moses, give us water. If I were Moses, I'd tell him to shut up. I'm trying to sleep. So (laughs) watch what happens. Moses is crying out to the Lord. What am I going to do? They're ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, well, go out there. (laughs) No way I'm going out there. They're ready to kill me. And he says, well, take with you the elders of Israel and what else? That's right. So I can see Moses. He's in the tent and he sticks out his rod. This is when he divided the water with. Get out of here. Get back. And everyone goes, ooh, the rod. And they're backing up. You know, Moses is trying to give himself some space as he's out there. And, uh, He also says, you know, the one you smote the river with when that turned it to blood. And he's like, okay, you people back up or I'll turn you to blood. And he says, behold, I'm going to stand before you there on the rock in Horeb and you will do what? Okay, you want to smite that (laughs) rock with a rod. You go out there and you smite the rod, not the people. And water will come out that the people can drink. And so Moses did so in the sight of the elders and he called the name of the place Masa and Meribah because of the, the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying is the Lord among us or not and then what happened then came Amalek and fought with Israel do you know murmuring and complaining always leads to an Amalek experience if you're murmuring and you're complaining you're going to invite an Amalek experience I think that's very important to understand. But the question is, is the Lord among us or not? That was the question. In Exodus 17, 15 through 16, Moses built an altar and he called the name of it Jehovah Nisi or the Lord is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with who? Amalek from generation to generation. What does that mean? He will have a war with Amalek from generation to generation. That means Amalek's goal was to kill all of Israel. And what this is saying, in every generation, there will be a nation that wants to destroy Israel. Hitler was the Amalek of the 21st, you know, or 22nd, right in there, the... 1940s. That was Amalek. Today, the Amalek is Iran. That's the nation that wants to destroy Israel. That's just set. 
But there's going to be an Amalek in every generation. But that also means every generation is going to be a murmuring and complaining generation, which is why God said, well, I find faith when I come. Now, Amalek, here's one thing I just want to bring out too many of you may not know. So Amalek is, let's just say, even though this date is wrong, I'm going to throw out, let's say 1500 BC is Moses and Amalek, right? Why about 500, 400 years later comes King Saul. And now they're in the land. He's their first king. And God tells Saul, okay, now I want you to go do what I promised and wipe out Amalek and start with Agag. Agag is the king of Amalek. And what does Saul do? He doesn't kill everybody. And so God removes him as king. So that was about 500 years from Amalek attacking Moses. 500 years later, you have King Saul. He doesn't kill all the Amalekites. And so what happens 500 years later? You have the book of Esther. And who are the, who's the bad person in the book of Esther? Haman. And who's the good guy? Mordecai. When you read the text, Mordecai is a direct descendant of Saul. Haman is a direct descendant of Agag, the Agagite. God knew what was coming 500 years later because Saul didn't do his job. 500 years later, his descendant is facing Agag's descendant and who wants to wipe out the Jews. So all that time, every generation, there was an Amalek. And even to this day, there are Amaleks in every generation. Okay, with that said, we're going to jump into the Hebrew letter cough. Cough, like the word cough. Okay. Let me see. In the ancient Hebrew, the letter cough looked like an open hand. This is what it looked like. We have the letter Yud, and the letter Yud means a closed hand. It means a work or a deed. The letter Kaf is an open hand. Now, what is that saying? If your deeds, this is one saying I think is interesting. The letter Yud means your work, your working, your deeds. But it is said that if your deeds exceed your knowledge, your knowledge will endure. If your knowledge exceeds your deeds, your knowledge will fade away. If you know all the stuff and you don't do anything with it, what happens if you learn a language and don't use it? You lose it. And so if what you know exceeds what you do, you're going to lose what you know. Now, let's look at our letters we began with. All right, on the top left, Remember, that is the letter Aleph, and then Bait, and then Gimel, Dalit, Hey, and Vav. All right. The next one, we have the Zayin, uh, the Yud. Let me see. Okay, you have the Zayin. Then we did the Tet. Now, the circle with the X is the ancient font. You see the letter Tet next to Tet. And uh, the yud, which means your hand, you see the arm with the elbow in the hand. And there's the ancient cough that looks like the open hand, but it actually looks like this in the modern font. But I just wanted you to see what the picture language was. So that's the modern cough, and there's the ancient cough. The word, see in Hebrew, every letter is a word, and the word cough means palm. That's what it is. Now, I'm going to tell you the story. I haven't told you the story in every letter, but I'm going to begin. And let me go back for a minute here. Okay. Oh, there we are. Now, if you remember, the Aleph represents who? The father. And what does the father do? He sends the letter bait, referring to his son. You have the father, the son, and the son is housed, which is why bait means house. He's housed in flesh. 
right? And then the father sends the son, okay? The gimel refers to the Holy Spirit. And so we find now the son, father sends the son, the son sends the Holy Spirit to the person behind the dalet, and the dalet means a door, and dal means the poor man. So we have the father sends the son, the son sends the spirit to the poor man behind the door, and then that leads us to the uh, letter hey, which refers to the breath of God, referring to us being born again. The breath of uh, life is breathed back into us. That's the hey. That brings us to the letter vav, which is a connection. So now, and also man was created on the sixth day. So the vav also represents man as well as being connected, but he's connected to the Torah. And once he's connected to the Torah, then comes the zain, and the zain is a weapon. Okay, so now he's equipped to have the weapon that he's going to use to fight the spiritual fight. And then this, the Zion turns over to the Chet and the Chet, or I mean, the, let me see what I got here. Yeah, the Chet, oh, I didn't have that up there, did I? But the Chet is like a hedge of protection that's around you. And then you get the tet, which is a spiritual, the God himself who is surrounding you. And then you're now surrounded by God's presence, being in God's hand, which is the yud because of his work, engraving you on the cough, the palm of his hand. So the story just goes all the way through. So here we have uh, the cough. And I want to bring something out here. In number, or Psalm, here it is. Psalm 128, verse two, it says, you shall eat the labor of your hands, and that is the word cough there, and happy you will be, and it will be well with you. And then in Numbers uh, 7, 84, it talks about the dedication of Moses' tabernacle. And it says, uh, this was the dedication of the altar in the day when it was anointed by the princes of Israel, 12 charges of silver, 12 silver bowls, and 12 spirits. Spoons. Well, we know the spoon is an extension of the hand. Now, I want to point out one thing, though. People get the letter cough confused with the letter bait. That's the letter bait, and that's the cough. Can you tell the difference? So when you're looking at the Hebrew, just know uh, you could be fooled. It's a straight line coming down, not a curved line. And uh, the green letter, the bait, you notice at the bottom, the back extends past the vertical line coming down. So I just want to let you know that. But anyway, to the dedication of the altar, the word spoon there, uh, you have uh, the word cough. So I wanted you to know that just like the spoon is the extension of the hand, uh, it means to feed. So the letter cough is spelled out as a word in the picture language. Now in John 14, 12, well, as a matter of fact, the word cough, you see, is a cough and a pay. Pay is mouth. In Hebrew, the letter pay means mouth, and the cough is a spoon. So the very word cough means having a spoon and stick it in someone's mouth. You're feeding them. That's the concept. So I want you to understand the word cough is an open hand. Uh, also, when the letter cough is often at the beginning of a word, it means to be like something. There's the king, and there's someone who's like a king. Then that would have the letter cough in front of it. Um, let's see. But what's interesting, if Messiah is a king, and we're to be kings like him, then it will involve the work of our hands that we have to do, just as we're the result of the work of his hands. Here we are. He's the potter, we're the vessel, right? Right? And so uh, we also have to understand as the letter cough means to work, we're to do the work also with our hands, like his works. So it's not our works, it's his works that we're doing. As a matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, it says we are his what? We're his handiwork. We're his workmanship, or it means his handiwork, created in Yeshua HaMashiach unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So this is an important situation because in the church today, 
they always say, well, we're not saved by works. That's true. We're not saved by works. We're saved by grace. But look at this. God has ordained works before the foundation of the world that we are to be doing. So we're saved by grace, but we're rewarded for our works. If your faith is not strong enough to change your behavior, it's not strong enough to change your destiny. If your, uh, uh, if your faith is not strong enough to change your behavior, why would you think it's strong enough to change your destiny? That's an interesting thought. Our salvation is totally dependent upon God's grace and mercy, but our rewards in the world to come are based on what we're doing now. We live in a world of doctrinal extremes. Some are very legalistic and tend to emphasize works, while others put so much emphasis on grace, they ignore that the very works they bring them, that they bring will bring them rewards in the world to come. Now, also with the letter cough, in number 786, it says these golden spoons were 12 full of incense and think of these spoons as cough it's in our hands is the incense that we're to offer up to the Lord as a matter of fact listen to Psalm 141 verse 2 let my prayer be set forth before you as what and the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice so the, think of the letter cough as the lifting up of your hands as the evening sacrifice in praise to God. Now, keter, this is the word keter, the cough, the tav, and the resh. Uh, that equals 620, uh, the numerical value of that. And keter means crown. Now, it is said there are three crowns in the Torah. The three crowns, there's the crown of the Torah, there's the crown of the priesthood, and there's the crown of the king. I have uh, above the priest there the word Kohen, even it begins with the cough. Kohen is priest. So there's the crown of the Torah, the crown of the priesthood. That's why he wears a crown, but also the crown of the king. Now, did you know there were three vessels in the temple that were also topped with crowns? What vessels in Moses' tabernacle had crowns? Well, there was the crown all on the top of the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 25, 10, and 11. They shall make an ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, and a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high, and you shall overlay it with pure gold. You shall overlay it inside and out, and shall make on it a crown of gold all around it. So the ark of the covenant had a crown. And they say that, uh, let's see, the next one, the crown Okay the, okay, the crown on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, they say, alludes to the crown of the Torah because that's within it. The crown on the altar of incense, there was a crown on the altar of incense, alludes to the crown of the priesthood who's offering it. Exodus 30, verse one through three. You're to make an altar to burn incense on it and you'll make it of acacia wood. A cubit will be its length, a cubit its breadth. It'll be square. Two cubits will be the height. It's horns from itself, and you shall overlay it with pure gold, its top, its sides, and its horns, and you will make it to it a crown of gold all around. And then Exodus 29, 6, it says, you shall put the miter on the priest's head and put the holy crown upon the miter. Well, the crown on the table of showbread alludes to the crown of the king. That's why in Exodus 25, 23, and 24, it says you're to make a table of acacia wood, two cubits will be the length, a cubit will be the breadth, a cubit and a half the height, and you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a crown of gold on it. Because so I wanted you to understand the crowns, the different kinds of crowns. Well, now look at Exodus 19, verse 5 and 6. It was God's intention that the entire nation of Israel wear all three crowns. They were to have the crown of the priest. They were to have the, the crown of the king, and they were to have that crown of the Torah within them. In Exodus 19, uh, 
5 and 6, now therefore, if you'll obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be a peculiar treasure to me above all people of the earth is mine, for all the earth is mine, and you will be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Now, I want to refer to some other crowns. The crown of the Torah refers to the crown of life in the New Testament. Deuteronomy 32, verse 46 and 47. He said to them, set your hearts unto all the words that I testify among you this day, which you'll command your children to observe, to do all the words of this ta- law, for it is not a vain thing because it is your what? Life. So the law is life. So the crown of the Torah is, when the New Testament talks about the crown of life, that's what it's talking about. And James 1:12. Blessed is a man that endures temptation, for when he's tried, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord promises to those who love him. The crown of the priesthood you're going to see is the crown of righteousness that's mentioned in the New Testament. Psalm 132, 9, let your priests be clothed with righteousness and let your saints shout for joy. And what do we see in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8? Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. And then we have the crown of the king. That, in the New Testament, is called the crown of glory, which is why in Isaiah 62, verse 3, it says, you shall also be a crown of glory in the cough in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. And in 1 Peter 5, 4, when the chief shepherd will appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. Isn't that amazing how you can tie all these together? And again, the cough or keter refers to the cough. It begins, and that's your hand. The fourth vessel in the temple was the golden menorah, and it was filled with the anointing oil that also is referred to as a crown. In Leviticus 21, 12, neither shall he go out of the sanctuary nor profane the sanctuary of his God for the crown of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am the Lord. Well, the crown of a good name is the crown of rejoicing that it is talking about also in the New Testament. So I just think it's amazing how each one of these letters tell a story, and when we get done with Tav, you'll see the whole Hebrew alphabet actually tells us a story. With that said, let's stand, and let's pray, and as a reminder, uh, after we pray, we'll have the final song, I'll do the priestly benediction, and then those who are new to El Shaddai Ministries, you're welcome to go through the lobby Turn left down by the kids' area and go to the right, and uh, Lance and Shani will be there, and I'll be in there, and we're going to be there to answer any questions that you may have. Avinu Mokenu, our Father King, we just thank you so much that we could come and worship you and praise you. Father, I pray that you would bring hearts back to you. Bring people's hearts back to you. Father, we want everyone here to receive every crown so that we can take those crowns and throw them back at your feet. We just want to love you and honor you with all of our being. In Yeshua's name, amen. Now, before I pray the priestly blessing, if the prayer team wants to come up, and if anybody wants prayer, you can come up, and we'll play the final song. Amen. Just as God told Moses to tell Aaron to say this prayer over his people, not only would he bless them, but he's going to put his name upon them. And this is what he told him to say. Ivarekaka Adonai Vishmareka, Yaer Adonai Panavileka Vishuneka. He saw Adonai Panavilaka Vyasem Laka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in that most wonderful name. Amen. We'll see you next week. And the visitors, we'd be glad to meet you on the other side.